Presenting the world's greatest mysteries. And now, your host. This is Basil Rathbone. Mystery, suspense, perhaps sudden death are the tokens of a roving reporter's trade. They're all here in these tales which Mike tells. They are the ingredients that make the news and... Mike finds them where the news is made. To anyone else, it might be just an unrelated fact. Perhaps, well, a not very interesting item of news which came in on the ticker tape. Or a word which was dropped in casual conversation. But it's enough to make him grab the fastest transport at hand and send him speeding to the scene. In a moment, our story. Presenting Europe Confidential. The Count del Garno stayed here almost two months, and during that time he made no attempt to pay his hotel bill. I asked him to settle several times. Always I was put off with promises. You mean he finally cleared out the back way? I thought it would happen, but it didn't. Just three weeks ago he left here, Mr. Conoy, and his account was paid by a woman. In a moment, we'll bring you Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy, the Paris correspondent of a famous American newspaper, in another exciting story in our series, Europe Confidential. This is Mike Canoy. I work for an American paper in Paris. What happens to the lucky winners of the big football pools in England? Does their sudden wealth bring them happiness or tears? Does it enrich their lives or ruin them? I thought it might be human interest material to find out what happens when an ordinary person comes into a fortune. About the time I was gathering my first stories on winners of spectacular football pools, an incident took place at an airport outside Paris where two people, an Englishman and his wife, were waiting the arrival of a plane. Attention, attention. L'avion prêt pour midi, venant de Cairo et de Rome, va s'engager dans un stand à l'autre sous la piste d'atterrissage numéro 5. Attention, attention. What was all of that, Philip? The plane from Rome is due on runway 5. Uh, come on, we'll get near the barrier, huh? You can see Aunt Emily when she comes off. As the two people moved toward the barrier, the plane came in low from the west, landed, taxied to a point of disembarkation. The doors were opened, the steps wheeled into position, and one by one, the passengers left the aircraft. She must be the last to get off the plane, Philip. Savoring every minute of the big adventure. (laughs) I suppose you'll be surprised to see us. Yes, but we're not letting her go traipsing around Paris the way she's been doing in Rome. Be careful how you broach the subject. She's uh, rather touchy since she became so independent. I think I know how to handle her. After all, we're offering her a good home with us in London. Yes, and we have gone to considerable trouble and expense to meet her so far from home. Philip, where is she? That's strange. The hostess is getting off and all the other passengers seem to disembark. Look, they're shutting the plane doors. We'd, We'd better try and talk to the hostess if she's English. Come on, Joyce. 
Excuse me, hostess. Yes, sir? My name is Davidson. This is my wife. We were expected to meet my aunt, Miss Emily Davidson, on this plane. Miss Davidson? And she sent us a cable to say this was the plane she intended taking, hostess. And she was going to stop off in Paris for a few days, so we came all this way to meet her. I'm afraid Miss Davidson cancelled her booking at the last minute. Cancelled it? Do you know why? No, sir. She was actually aboard the plane when a message came for her. Apparently, she changed her mind about leaving Rome. Changed her mind? But what message? Who sent it? I'm unable to tell you any more than I have, Mrs. Davidson. The message came from the booking desk at the airport. When we were due for takeoff, I went to the clerk there and asked about the passenger. I was told that she'd ordered her luggage removed from the plane and had cancelled her seat. This is really very strange. Uh, thank you, hostess. Sorry to have troubled you. Uh, perfectly all right, sir. Yes, madam. Can I help you? Philip, what are we going to do? Well, what can we do? Well, let's send a cable to her hotel in Rome. Tell her we're waiting in Paris and make her realize the trouble she's put us to. No. No, that's not the way. Well, what do you suggest? I think we'd better go home. Home to London after all this? We can't stay on in Paris meeting every plane. Anyway, it wasn't such a bright idea. Well, it was your idea. I know, but I was wrong. Far better we wait for Aunt Emily to turn up in London, and when she does, then we'll welcome her as if nothing has happened. Is she going to turn up? Well, of course. Well... We'll wait a couple of weeks, at least. And if we haven't heard from her by then? We'll wait and see. Come on. Let's see about getting a plane back home. Several weeks after this happened, I had a visitor from London. He introduced himself, named Philip Davidson, an Englishman. He told me briefly the reason for his visit. We saw a copy of your column, Mr. Conroy. You're running a series of winners of English football pools. Well, that's right, Mr. Davidson. You one of the lucky people? Well, I'm not, but um, I can give you a story about someone who is. Her name is Emily Davidson, and she's an aunt of mine. She won £60,000, and she's been missing for the past three weeks. Emily Davidson was 42 years of age, a spinster who had lived a quiet and uneventful life. Every week she had spent a few shillings filling out the coupons of the well-known football pool, and one week she'd brought off the national dream and won 60,000 pounds. These were the brief facts that her nephew, Philip Davidson, gave to me in my office in Paris. I don't know whether you're interested, Conroy, but she won a pool, and now she is missing. Oh, I'm very interested. Suppose you give me a few more facts, huh? Certainly. After her big win, she flew off to Italy for a holiday. My wife and I were very fond of Aunt Emily. We didn't want her to go, but she insisted. Well, she wrote after a few weeks to say that she was coming home. And we flew to Paris to meet her, hoping to give her a pleasant surprise. Instead, she gave you the surprise by not turning up. That's about the strength of it. You know where she stayed in Rome? Yes, a hotel on the Via Nationale. I have the address. I wrote there, and they said that she'd left to catch her plane. What's more, she actually boarded that plane, so the hostess told us. But a message came that made her change her mind. And since then, we've heard nothing. Did you go to the police about it? I don't fear we should do that. We thought of a private inquiry agent. And frankly, when we saw your newspaper series, we hoped you'd be interested. Interested enough to try and locate her. I see. Well, I can't go chasing off at the slightest whim just because a pool's winner disappeared, Mr. Davidson. Still, the chances are that I have to go to Rome at the weekend to cover another story. Supposing you give me the address of that hotel in Rome and any other details you can. Now, it happened that while I was in Rome the following weekend, I went to a hotel where Emily Davison had stayed. At that stage, the story was only of minor interest, and I didn't intend to be anyone's free detective, as it seemed Philip Davidson hoped I would be. Uh, yes, senor. Do you remember the senorina Davidson? She stayed here for several weeks. She didn't return at any time since May the 15th, the day she was due to take that plane home. No, we have not seen her. There was a letter from some relatives in England. Yeah, I know about them. Tell me, uh, while Miss Davidson was here, did she meet any people, or get friendly with anyone in particular? There was a one man. He was not a resident here, but often he came to visit her. Can you recall his name or anything about him? Oh, yes, senor. He was a count. A Hungarian, I think. A count del Garno. He was a very attentive to the English signorina. Very attentive indeed. 
account, genuine or otherwise, added reader interest. From the hotel, I went to the airport, and after some inquiry, located the receptionist who was on duty at the booking desk on the day that Emily Davidson had canceled her plane booking. I talked to her about the message that had been received. Message? Yes, I remember the day, Senor Conroy. The English Senorina was aboard of the plane when the call came for her. I told her the hostess. Could you uh, think back three weeks, do you think, and uh, recall the details of that message, ma'am? No, it was a gentleman, that I can tell you. All he said was for the signorina to telephone him at the Sebastiano Hotel. I asked for a name, but he said she would know who it was. Then I explained the signorina was already aboard the plane, and, and he told me it was important, very important. So you got her off, and that was the last you saw of her? No, that was the last, signor. Hmm. the Sebastiano Hotel... Well, thanks anyway. Thanks very much. No, Mr. Conoy. I'm afraid there's no record of a Miss Davidson ever staying at our hotel. Certainly not in the past few weeks. Hmm, let's see. Uh, you got any record of a guy called Delgarno? Count Delgarno? Delgarno? You know him? Certainly. Are you a friend of the Count? No, I don't even know him. But I have reason to think that he's mixed up in the disappearance of Emily Davidson. Oh, then perhaps I can speak freely. Uh, the Count did stay here. He was not a previous resident, but he came to us with high credentials. Credentials? Oh, sometimes we have to ask for previous recommendations, you understand. There are so many today who do not pay their hotel bills. Uh, people like Del Gardno who masquerade their way into the best places. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, did you say people like Del Garno? The Count Del Garno stayed here almost two months. And during that time, he made no attempt to pay his hotel bill. Uh -huh. I asked him to settle several times. Always I was put off with promises. You mean that he finally cleared out the back way? I thought it would happen, but it didn't. Just three weeks ago, he left here, Mr. Conoy, and his account was paid by a woman. A woman? Can you uh, describe her? I saw her, but I did not meet her. She was in her 40s, I would say. Attractive, without being young. Dressed quietly. It was the manner of her dress which makes me feel she was an English woman. Well, that night I called my paper in Paris and told my editor the progress I'd made because he was the kind of guy who had to okay the expense sheet if I stayed on in Rome. I learned that a cable had come from Philip Davidson in London with the news that he'd received a letter from his aunt with no address but postmarked Naples. In the letter, Emily Davidson said that she had married married a man named Count Delgarno. The chief told me to take a train to Naples and continue the search. My stories about the people who had won big pool prizes had so far been routine. But here at last we seem to have a tale with an offbeat flavor, if not something more sensational. Naples is a big town. Checking the hotels there is a man-sized job. But I kept at it, knowing that if they were in this city, they'd have to be living somewhere. And, well, eventually that was how I found their trail again. Un momento! Ah, buongiorno, signore. Bella giornata. Desidera una stanza? Yeah, say, wait a minute. Uh, do you know any English? Ah, uh, English, no. Americano, yeah. Oh, swell. Ah, no swell. That means they're good. A swell day, you think? Yeah, great. Uh, look, I wanted to ask you... You are Americano. Yeah, that's right, Bob. Ah, my cousin Mario, he goes to America to live. New York he lives. Uh, you live in New York? Uh, when I'm home. Ah, then maybe you know my cousin. Sure you know him. Everybody knows everybody in America. Well, it's a pretty big place. Uh, we could have missed each other. Oh, but you couldn't have missed my cousin. He's a very fat. Yeah, well, look, forgetting your fat cousin for a moment, uh, have you any record of two people staying here in the past couple of weeks? A guy called Count Delgarno? Ah, uh, the Count. You know the Count, too. He was in America once, and he remembers my cousin. You mean to say that Count Delgarno is here? Was, Senor Americano, the Count and the Countess. The Countess? You mean Miss Davidson? I mean his wife, the Countess. Oh, was her name Emily? Oh, so you know her too. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. These are very good. Yeah, when did they leave? Oh, wait a days ago. The county, he wants to go to sea. The lady, she says we buy a boat. 
What? Oh, she has a plenty of money. You ought to see, senor, the way she spends it on him. Oh, ho, ho. she is a very in love, very happy. And the money, it flows like a wine in the fest. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, you wouldn't know where they went to buy this boat. Sure, from my cousin. Huh? But I thought he was in the States. Ah, this is another cousin. Castro, he has more cousins than you can count. The one who sells the boats is called Gino. Yeah, well, where do I find Gino? Ah, he has a boat shed on the south shore. Wait, I give you a note to take to him. You tell Gino, I say for him to help you. So, you talk to my cousin Castro, senor. Oh, I bet you talk. I bet he does most of the talking, huh? Yeah, I bet you're right there, Gino. Look, uh, uh, what about the Count Delgarno and his English wife? Did they buy a boat from you? They bought the boat. Yeah, what kind? A cabin cruiser. The best I had. The lady, she wanted the best. Oh, I see. Well, maybe you can give me the name of this vessel and its general description, huh? I named it La Bella More. Oh, it is a white cabin cruiser, senor. I can give you all the details if you'll come up to the boat shed, huh? <laughs> We circulated the name of the boat and its description to all ports and sat down to wait. Meanwhile, two things were becoming more obvious. One, that the lady was leaving a trail of happy salesmen in her wake, and two, that her nephew and his wife were becoming increasingly unhappy as the days passed. The night after I returned to Paris to await developments, there was a call from Philip Davidson from London. I appreciate that you're doing all you can, Mr. Conroy, but I think if she's not found soon, there's going to be trouble. What do you mean, Mr. Davidson? I learned from the bank today. She's withdrawn her entire account, over 50,000 pounds sterling. She's carrying that amount with her in cash. Two days later, we got the break we wanted. The harbor master at St. Elmo on the Italian coast reported that the cruiser La Bella More was at anchor there. I left by plane that same night, and the following day I was in the small seaport. Small ships were riding at anchor in the harbor, and the sun was an orb of fire at the edge of the horizon. A motor launch guided its way toward one of the stationary cruisers. It was six o'clock in the evening, and the sea was a gentle swell of dissolving shadows. La Bella More! Ahoy there! Ahoy! In the exchange of greetings that followed, I asked permission to tie up and come aboard. And this was readily granted by the woman who leaned on the deck rail watching my approach. Welcome aboard, whoever you are. Visitors are always welcome. Miss Emily Davidson? That was me. I'm the Countess Delgano now. Impressive, isn't it? And who are you? Um, the name is Mike Conoy, ma'am. Newspaper man. Ah, the press. What have we done to deserve this, Mr. Conoy? <laughs> You're supposed to be missing, didn't you know? Missing? Me? Yeah, the football pool winner who disappeared. Oh, oh, really, Mr. Conoy? This is delightful. I wish my husband Alex were here to enjoy the joke. Well, is it really that funny? Your nephew and his wife have been very worried about you, you know. In fact, they first came to me and set me off on this business of finding you. Philip and Joyce? Ah, I see. Huh? I suppose I should have written to them, but oh, that was something I kept putting off. I'm rather afraid they won't understand. You mean about Count Delgarno? Mm. About your meeting in Rome and getting off the plane at the last minute? I see you've been catching up on my activities, Mr. <laughs> Canoy. <laughs> well, we know most of the story. You met the Count in Rome, paid his hotel bill. Oh, the poor dear was absolutely broke. Mm -hmm. You married him in Naples, spent money lavishly on him, you bought him this boat. I bought it for us, Mr. Canoy, Alex and me. A marriage, after all, is a partnership. With you supplying the necessary. 
At least, that's the way your nephew feels. He thinks you've been snared by a pretty smart fortune hunter. Isn't it strange, Mr. Canoy? You fill in a funny little card, and by some miracle, you win a large sum of money. And suddenly, a nephew and his wife, who never wants to know you before, can't bear to have you out of their sight. They ask me to live with them. Do you know where I was living before? No, where? In a hostel. The coldest, emptiest place. And I was never really welcome at my nephew's when I went to visit. But win 60,000 pounds, which is quite a ridiculous amount of money, I think you'll agree. And all that changes. Mm -hmm. Your sort. You decide on a holiday in Italy and it alarms them. You fail to come home when you're expected, and they go to the newspapers. Well, you could be misjudging these people, you know. They even went to Paris to welcome you home. To escort me home, Mr. Canoy, for fear I'd spend too much of that money and leave none for them. It may be uncharitable, but then I know my nephew and his wife rather well. And uh, Count Delgarno, ma'am? How well do you know him? I know he's a gentleman, Mr. Canoy. I know I love him. Yeah, well, that's your affair, I guess. But I'd like you to understand about Alex. His real name is Alexandre Malonier Delgarno, and he's quite penniless. He lost everything when the war came, and all he has now is a batch of worthless papers to prove his birthright and the lands his family owned. And tell me, uh, the title is genuine? Quite genuine. I met him in Rome, and we saw a great deal of each other. He told me he loved me, and I knew how I felt about him. The last night before I was due to leave for home, I, I did something rather awful. I asked Alex to marry me. You asked him? <laughs> I think even Alex was shocked. He refused, saying that he had nothing. He didn't know then that I had money. I told him I was a schoolteacher on holiday. Uh, I'm beginning to see it. That message at the airport, uh, it was the count. Yes, it was from Alex. He said we'd be married and make out somehow or other. Then I told him, and that brought on an awful scene. But in the end, I had my way. I can be rather determined when I want something, Mr. Canoy. Yeah, I guess you can at that. Where's Count Delgarno now? He's gone ashore to bank the money. He drew out most of what was left, over 20,000 in English currency value, and carried it aboard the boat when we left Naples. We decided to bank it, and the Count's gone ashore to do that. 20,000? Well, now you know what to tell my nephew and his wife, Mr. Canoy. Tell them we probably won't have a penny left at the end of a couple of years, but they'll be the best two years of my life. Alex and I'll have to settle down and earn a living then, but first I want to make up for all the years in that hostel, all the years of being a poor relation. And that's just what I'm doing. But listen, ma'am, uh, this money the Count took ashore, it was a lot to trust any guy with. W what time did he leave? Early this afternoon. And he's not back yet? Well, he wanted to spend some time looking around the town. <laughs> I can see you're still not entirely convinced, Mr. Canoy. Well, it's not that, ma'am. I just don't want to see you taken down. <laughs> oh, by my husband. You've been listening to that nephew of mine. Just come over to the rail, Mr. Canoy. Yeah? You see that motor launch? That's Alex now. You'd better stay for dinner, Mr. Canoy. Stay and meet my husband. I think you two will get on rather well together.
have been listening to Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy in another exciting episode in the series, Europe Confidential. This is Basil Rathbone again. It seems mystery is a tonic to our friend Mike. So another story has gone to press, another mystery solved. But there are many more stories to tell. They have their beginnings in the dark alleyways or the, well, brightly lit boulevards of Europe. We hope you'll join us again to hear them. Goodbye now till we meet again to listen to another of the world's greatest mysteries.